Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Corey Davey. I am the managing partner for Control Risks uh, for Australia Pacific. So I'm based in Sydney, but very excited to be down with you guys today. I'm actually married to a Kiwi, so I tend to spend quite a bit of time down here, back for the first time in two and a half years. So I'm very excited. I'm also coming off of two weeks at a holiday in Wanaka. So if I just kind of wander off at some point, my brain hasn't quite clicked back into gear yet. Um, I also, as you can see, have one non-working leg. So if I suddenly kind of grab the chair, don't worry about me. Um, I, my background is actually in humanitarian operations. So I come to control risk from a very different perspective, but one which I think is quite unique for the ESG perspective. So I used to run internally displaced person camps and refugee camps across Africa and various conflict zones and natural disaster zones around the world. Um, and then I joined Control Risks and had to learn about the world of risk. Um, and I'm still learning 12 years later. Uh, but I think that the sort of risk-based approach to ESG is one that I think not enough companies are taking. And I'm gonna talk you through what I mean about this, but it is, as Nigel said, it's just too big. There's too much to look at. And if you're trying to, whatever the cliche is, boil the ocean or eat the whole elephant or whatever it is, you're not gonna achieve everything that you want to achieve. And it's also very easy to get tempted into the idea that maybe we don't need to pay attention to it as much as we thought we did. I've heard some people talking about the idea that we're in a green pause, that with so much else going on in the world with Ukraine and all the energy prices and inflation and COVID and da 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 da, da now is not the time to be focused on sustainability and ESG issues, that we need to be focused on other priorities. But I think we all know that that's probably not true. And that's not just because of what our customers and our communities are telling us. We look at things like the IPCC report that came out this year. We look with our own eyes, a third of Pakistan underwater, what happened in the north of the South Island in the last few weeks, droughts, et cetera. These are all issues which are becoming more and more relevant for our risk registers, but also for a much wider variety of stakeholders. And it's not just climate. I think climate gets the big focus because it is so present and there are very obvious things that are happening. But Nigel mentioned before modern slavery. But even if we look at with Ukraine, the sanctions risk that many of us suddenly faced throughout our supply chains that we might not have considered, there are really big sort of social and reputational issues that can spin out of the geopolitical events that we see in the world. And I think sustainability is absolutely critical for the operational resilience of your company. It's about ensuring that you can thrive by recognizing these sorts of risks, which wouldn't always have made it into the risk register, particularly because these are not easy decisions to make. It's not binary. It's not like employ small children or don't. Like these are not easy decisions. You know, if we look at Ukraine, if you had operations in Russia, do you shut them down or do you not? If you do shut them down, you're having a seriously negative impact on your employees, on your customers, on your suppliers, on your shareholders potentially. But if you don't shut it down, you're facing massive reputational risks, sanctions risks, you know, potential boycotts. Certainly, I would guess a Twitter storm or a TikTok storm, whatever happens these days. So these are not easy decisions to make. So what you need is you need a framework that helps you go, okay, these are our values as a company. This is what we prioritize. These are the things that we put most important. But then also, these are the risks that are most important to us. You know, sanctions risk is going to be really high on our risk register for whatever reason. Environmental vulnerability is very high on our risk register for whatever reason. And you have prioritized this. You've thought about it ahead of time so that when the black swan event, that I don't even think we can call things black swan events anymore because the whole world seems to be full of black swans now, you know why you're making the decision you're making. You've got that framework in place. It makes you more resilient. I'm gonna talk you guys through today a little bit. I'm gonna talk through stakeholders, look at the ESG ecosystem, and then what you need to be considering as risk professionals to help guide your company as they try and approach ESG. Some of this, I'm sure all of you are going to be really familiar with. And so please do, as I just said, feel free to zone out, look at the sparkly water, do your phones. But also, please do feel free to ask questions at the end. I am 
not an ESG expert because I'm not sure anyone could claim to be, and I'm sure there's a zillion acronyms I don't know, but what I can promise you is that I have lots of experts at my disposal, and so if there's any questions I can't answer, I will go away and get answers and come back to you, so I can't promise you that. I'm kind of 2% smart on everything, then I fall off a cliff, so that's always my caveat. So I want to start with the actual acronym of ESG. When I went away on maternity leave with my youngest child, I had never heard this acronym before. And then I came back and it was everywhere. And I was like frantically Googling in meetings, trying to figure out what this was. And the term itself is an investor created term. This is a Wall Street term. And it very much lives in the investment and financial space in a lot of ways. The concepts are not new. Companies were already doing this, right? You were dealing with social benefit through things like CSR. You were dealing with governance through compliance, anti-bribery and corruption programs, et cetera. You were even dealing with environmental risk through EIA requirements or whatever it might be. What the ESG movement was doing was tying all of these together under one umbrella and theoretically giving each of the different elements equal prominence, although I think that's really not true. I think that environment and climate still is definitely the primary focus for most of the stakeholders in the financial space in particular. We'll, we'll speak about the others in a moment. So if we think about where the ESG pressure is coming from, it's actually a wider stakeholder group than you might think. So we've got Activists, which is what many people think about, um, bearing in mind that activists can be internal to your business, that can be employees, that can be shareholders, as much as they are external, Extinction Rebellion or uh, you know, Amnesty International. You have your investors who are critical stakeholders and one which I will be getting into a lot more detail a bit later on on what they are wanting from companies around these issues. Regulators are increasing their prominence here. Um, it was previously a, maybe a bit wishy-washy and regulators weren't quite sure what they wanted to do, but they knew they wanted to do something. The EU is leading the way, but certainly not exclusively leading the way. And I'll, I'll talk about the, the regulatory landscape more in a moment. Employees cannot be underestimated here for a number of reasons about why this matters to them. And then you've got your customers, your partners, you've got your whole kind of wider ecosystem that you need to consider. And look, it's not just me saying this. I haven't randomly invented this idea. There was a Harvard Business Review survey last year where 78% of in-house counsels said they felt pressure on ESG last year. But what I think is really interesting is who they felt that pressure from. The highest group is employees. That was then followed by investors, then customers, and then activists. And so what I really want to hammer home here is that if you're thinking about what are your risks, what do you need to focus on, make sure you're not getting fixated on one stakeholder group. Don't just be thinking about your regulators or don't just be thinking about your investors because I think that you may potentially then miss some of the wider issues that you need to be focused on. You really need to be considering all the relevant areas. So I wanna start with a snapshot of the ESG ecosystem, because the reality is it isn't just the fact that these are really complex issues that have a lot of stakeholders. It's also just a super confusing landscape. There are so many different requirements and information providers and information gatherers. So I'm going to do a sort of fast canter through what I think of as being the key pillars of this ecosystem whom you need to think about. I'm going to go very fast and very high level. Again, very happy at lunchtime to speak about this in more detail. So let's start with those regulatory authorities. And in particular, what we're talking about here is sustainability disclosure guidance. So this has really surged since about 2000 when the Global Reporting Initiative published their first disclosure guidance. There are now between three and 400 mandatory sustainability provisions across more than 84 jurisdictions. And I'm sure that number is out of date. Every time I check, it increases. And in general, this disclosure guidance is related to prioritizes, rather, I should say, climate change. So the most well known of that is the non financial reporting directive, the NFRD from the EU, 2010 guidance from the SEC. But you, know, you yourself in New Zealand have the financial sector climate-related disclosure and other matters amendment, and there's plenty of others 
the way this guidance or this regulatory disclosure guidance is structured tends to fall into a few different categories depending on jurisdiction. And it helps to understand what are you trying to deal with? What are they actually trying to achieve? What do they want from you? So we'll start with the first kind of guidance, which is called interpretive guidance. So what this basically does is it clarifies or elaborates on existing guidance and tells you how to apply that guidance to sustainability information. So it's not creating new guidelines as much as it is sort of creating better sustainability nuance to existing guidelines. So the SEC 2010 guidance is a good example of this. You know, it basically is saying what about climate and other sustainability issues is mandatory for you to report on when you're making your disclosures. The second type of guidance is principles-based disclosure guidance. So what this does is it allows users, the companies to decide what information they believe would be useful for the market to know. What should they disclose based on sort of tenets, based on principles of what is important. So the current asset guidance in Australia falls under this. It's also what the NFRD is. The third type, which is one that I hadn't really been familiar with before I started delving more deeply into this world, is what's called comply or explain disclosure guidance. So this is particularly done in companies which want, with more um, emerging corporate cultures. So those where you might not have very sophisticated um, corporate compliance capabilities. And what they do is they put out, you know, this is the rule. You can either comply with the rule or you can explain to us why you are unable to comply with it and what you are doing to be able to comply with it. And the idea here is that many companies simply may not have the capability to gather the data that they need to assess it properly and to be able to present it, but we want them to build up their capability. So rather than creating a rule which they know a large part of their corporate environment will not be able to comply with, which kind of makes it useless, they're trying to help bring them along the journey. So the Philippines is an example of a jurisdiction which has this kind of disclosure guidance. The fourth kind, line item disclosure guidance. So this requires information to be disclosed using a specific methodology to produce specific line items, which are similar across jurisdictions. So the EU taxonomy, which any of you who have European exposure may be familiar with, came out this year. This is that kind of specific. And I believe, for reasons I'll get into in a moment, this is the way a lot of the guidance and this regulatory environment is going to be heading more towards specificity. So that's your sort of regulatory picture, right? This is what the governments are wanting you to do and say. Even with line item, it still leaves a lot of wiggle room. And so that is when then companies need a bit more help to go, okay, but how, what, what do we gather? How do we gather it? What do we look at? And that's where the disclosure frameworks and standards come into, the bay, come into play. At their most basic, they're basically a way for companies to consider what information do I need to collect? How do I analyze it? What am I presenting? How do I do it? Now, as a company, I mean, I've put up a few here and this is like not even beginning to scratch the surface of what is out there, you can't deal with all of them. So you as a company have to decide which framework or standard am I going to engage with? Because you can't engage with all of them, believe me, you'll go mad. And so when you are looking at the standards and frameworks, you can tell I like lists. There's six things that I want you guys to think about. The first is what's the scope of the information that it deals with? Does it deal with environmental, social, governance, economic matters? And what assets does it consider? Does it consider, you know, just your capital assets, people, whatever it might be? Because if you are trying to satisfy SEC requirements, which focus mostly on climate, maybe you could go with the TCFD, which is climate focused. But if you are trying to satisfy EU requirements, which have a huge amount of social, TCFD is not going to be enough. So you have to pick a framework which includes social and governance factors. So the second thing you want to think about is, is it a framework or a standard? So a framework sets out concepts and principles for how the information should be structured and prepared. And it broadly tells you 
one to cover. Standards are much more specific. They are replicable and give detailed guidance for what should be disclosed and how. But they can also be quite overwhelming and sometimes overkill for issues that may not be as relevant to your business. The third thing to think about is who is the primary audience of the standard or framework? Is it primarily focused on investors, on customers, on regulators? And there are definitely primary audi audiences. SASB, for example, which many of you may be familiar with, that is only focused on the investment community. That is who that standard is for. That may be great for you if you're you know, looking at capital as the primary reason why you're doing this, but not if you're trying to satisfy regulators or community concerns. Fourth thing to think about, how do they approach materiality? And you can really get yourself wound around the axle on this one. Quite a few of the standards focus on value creation, meaning how do ESG matters impact our value as a company? So it's how is climate change going to impact our value? How is modern slavery going to impact our value? Whereas others, take a double materiality approach, which is both how does ESG affect us, but then also how do we affect the environmental, social, and governance realities of the space in which we operate. And I think a number of people can be looking at those which take a value creation approach, and then they're trying to sort of twist that into also talking about their impact on the community. And it's better if you're concerned about that to choose a standard or a framework which takes a double materiality approach. The thing you want to think about is an industry agnostic or specific. So um, many of the frameworks and standards are industry agnostic, meaning you figure out yourself um, how this applies to your industry, you know, the, the environmental things which impact, say, a logistics transport company are going to be very different from those that impact a bank. And so you don't need to be looking at the same issues. So industry specific guidelines will break down by sector and even get into real detail of like subsector. You may be saying, why on earth wouldn't I choose industry specific? Well, the problem is if you're a company which has a complex business mix, doing industry specific can actually be really difficult and quite time consuming. And so you want to consider what's most relevant for your business mix. And then the last thing, the sixth thing is just think about time horizon. Um, you know, how far are you able with your data and your analysis to look into the future. Again, I put up some frameworks and standards here. I'm not gonna go into them. What I would say is that the TCFD has become the basis for a lot of disclosure guidance that we're seeing coming out of markets. And so if that's not one that you're familiar with, I would highlight it, um, particularly those who have Australian interest. It, is, it is, seems to be coalescing to where the Australian market is getting to with their disclosure guidance. Um, I would also highlight from a standards perspective, SASB and GRI are the most specific of the standards if you're looking for very specific standards. Now, some of you who are familiar with the ESG space are probably screaming in your heads right now because there is an effort to consolidate a lot of these standards and frameworks and to try and get, to try and get down to consolidated, a sort of consolidated thing that everyone uses. And I think there is a lot of intention and energy Behind this, I do not believe it's going to happen in the short to medium term. So while seven, 10 years from now, we may have one fantastic consolidated framework, I would say that if you're trying to get your insurance or get your financing or satisfy some other stakeholder in the next kind of three years, you're probably going to need to engage with, with these as they stand. So you've got your regulatory authorities. You can then use the standards to move to them. The next sort of bit of the ecosystem that people are often familiar with is the data aggregators, because there is all this data out there, right? There's all the sorts of data that's disclosed through sustainability reports or done through the disclosures, but there's share price data and there's data that's collected privately. And there are companies who essentially compile and present all of this ESG related data in one place, making it possible for investors <laughs> and investors are the primary audience of this, for them to be able to look at all companies in one place rather than having to source it directly from lots of different companies. 
Um, there's different types. There's those who deal with public, publicly available data, those who do survey. Um, so publicly available, structured and unstructured, that's your Bloomberg's, your rep risks. But then you have companies like B Analytics or S&P, CSA, who send out surveys to companies. And you can choose to fill out those surveys and then appear on their sort of data aggregator. Then we have the next level, which is the ESG ratings and analytics providers. Um, these again are primarily focused on the investor community. They have unique methodologies, which they utilize to score or rank companies. And so rather than aggregators who are just pulling information together, these guys have a sort of secret sauce that they're working on in the background. So these are the groups that so angered Elon Musk earlier this year, which doesn't appear to be difficult these days, when Exxon appeared to have a higher ESG ranking than Tesla. And they can have a huge amount of power, and I'll talk about this at the end a bit more, but many of the companies who come to us wanting help with ESG, this is the audience that they are trying to appeal to. They want to get a stronger ESG rating and they want to know how to do it. And that's what they're trying to achieve because it helps them get better access to capital. There are lots of other groups that I'm not even going to go into. You know, I've popped some things up here. There's platforms, there's investor specific standards. I mean, you know, Nigel mentioned that Marsh has their own way of looking at this data. It is a very crowded field. What I think I would try and remember here is that. What all of these groups are trying to do in lots of different complex and confusing and acronym based ways is to organize and process information so that companies can present impact, be it their impact on the world or the world's impact on them. And there's just too many different ways to do it right now, but that's what everyone's trying to achieve. So I spoke about the different stakeholders who are interested in all of this information here. And I wanted to dig into two a little bit more because I do think it's quite important to understand motivations here. So we'll start with investors because that's what many people care about. They, they do want to access capital and they want to be able to do it effectively. So what are investors looking for for ESG? First and foremost, they want comparable data points and they want standardized disclosures. Several large investors are unfortunately trying to achieve this by creating their own proprietary tools and their own materiality and rating tools that index across a wide variety of data sources. And so it can be very difficult to control this, but there's definitely a stronger push for this idea of standard and data. And that has led to what we're seeing as well, which is increasingly science-based targets. In the past, ESG has tended to be narratively oriented. I think we can look at things like UN Global Compact and things like that, where it's been a very narrative approach, SDGs, all of that. And the, there's a recognition that this is often too generic and it just doesn't allow for comparison of apples to apples. There's also a lot more pressure on companies to disclose outcomes. So back to the greenwashing point, this is not just about describing the actions you took, to manage your ESG risk. It's about then describing, and here's what happened. So you can't just say, we put in place a diversity, equity, and inclusion program. You have to say, and therefore we met these KPIs of reduction of the wage gap or increased presence of you know, disadvantaged groups in our middle management structure or whatever it might be. There is also, and I should say as well, sorry, on that one, the European Commission regulations, which are coming out now, seem to be really focusing on this, that they are not, they are not going to be structured around inputs at all, but instead are going to be structured around outputs. There is also a lot of discussion within the investment community about where the information should be disclosed. Is it a standalone report? Is it integrated into the annual report? Is it integrated only into filings? There is not a consensus on this. And so I think it's really about choosing who your primary stakeholders are for the information and discussing with them, where would they like it to be? If you don't have a preference as a company, if you're like, whatever, we'll write a standalone report, we'll make it an annex, find out what your primary stakeholders will want, because they're done. we cannot see a coalescing of consensus around this. It really varies by stakeholder and by jurisdiction. 
Um, and just to be really clear, this is not just about environment. We are seeing increasing expectations to disclose DE&I related metrics, targets, and outcomes. Um, again, particularly in the EU, where we're seeing really strong requirements around supply chain disclosure for social issues in your supply chain. And this is, this is gonna become significantly more complex in the next year or two. So that's your investors. If we look at the sort of wider stakeholders, the activists and the employees and those we spoke about, I think the investors are still primarily uh, almost exclusively interested in value, right? They're interested in that value materiality. The wider stakeholders, they're generally much more interested in impact. The impact that you as a company are having on the environment or a particular group or a particular issue which they are passionate about. And what they are asking is they are asking you to adjust your business model in some way to minimize that impact or to make it beneficial. Now, how they are asking that very significantly, right? Activist tactics range from things like demonstrations, blockades, just operational disruption, all the way through to threats. The underlying goal of all of it is to create enough reputational damage, moral outrage, or operational disruption that you have to change your behavior. And just to be clear, there is a small but legitimate security risk from some activist groups, even in New Zealand. We've been involved in a number of cases in the past couple of years where executives have found themselves being threatened, approached at their homes, um, and having to help them figure out how credible the threat is, particularly when it comes to online threats. And we, uh, we dealt with a case a couple of years ago where the, all the executives of a company were having their movements posted on a, sort of a, like a stockholder board. You know, where like day traders exchange information that's supposed to be, hey, buy this stock or buy that stock. And instead it would be like, we saw Jane here and here. And we, were, we had to try and assess, is this just more, you know, keyboard warriors? who happened to live in the small town where all of these people were based, or is this a credible threat? And also, how far can you go before the barriers that you're putting between the activists, the employees, and the executives is counter helpful? That's not the word, but you know what I mean? That you are now creating a situation where they feel even more removed in ivory tower. There's a lot of nuance to this, but it is a legitimate threat from some groups and one that does need to be taken seriously. But then you have, um, it isn't all just NGOs on the streets, right? It's not, not all just Extinction Rebellion. Uh, there are much more sophisticated legal and governance-based efforts, which we see going forward around these matters. Um, starting with shareholder activism, something I'm sure you're all familiar with, where shareholders, either a block of minority shareholders or an institutional shareholder, put pressure on the company for specific changes. To the governance, the business, the business mix, um, attention to emission reduction goals, whatever it might be. Um, but beyond that sort of AGM-based shareholder activism, we are also seeing uh, an increased approach to change or force change or force accountability through litigation. There have now been well over 1,200 cases filed globally trying to force climate change policy adjustment through the courts. And it's actually notable that Australia, neighbor to the north, is number two in the world for cases filed after the US. So it is, it's, a, it's a tactic that we see this region be very focused in. You might have seen, I don't know how much this would have reached outside of New South Wales, but um, there was a case which was lost on appeal earlier this year where a high school student sued the then environment minister trying to hold her responsible under duty of care laws for the approval that she had done for a coal mine expansion, claiming that she had violated the duty of care of the youth of the area where the coal mine was. There has not been much in the way of notable success with this approach, but I think it's gonna to continue to grow in sophistication. And it isn't only against government. Um, it can be against companies. Earlier this year, ACCR, which is a sort of peak body for shareholder activism in Australia, they took Santos to court, uh, basically claiming that they are making false or misleading claims around their uh, path to net zero and accusing them of, well, they're accusing them of greenwashing, but they've taken them to court under 
you know, un incorrect disclosures in filings. So this is, this is something which is focused not just on government, but on corporates. So we talked about activists, talked about governance, employees and employee tactics can be quite similar to activist tactics, right? Walkouts, letter writing campaigns, um, you know, in, on internal news boards, et cetera. But they have two unique sort of tools at their disposal, which companies have to think about. The first is that they can be an insider and leak information out. This can be catastrophic for companies from a reputational and from a legal perspective. Um, good recent example of this, Facebook, Uber, a couple of years ago, Volkswagen, and the line between whistleblowing and leaking obviously can be quite difficult to, to differentiate. We have a lot of companies that we're dealing with right now who are trying to figure out how to approach this insider threat, threat without seeming to be heavy handed towards their employees. And so it's, a, it's about a lot of listening and a lot of engagement, bringing the internal comms part of your business much more into the fold as a, as a risk mitigation tool, because this can, as I said, be quite catastrophic. The other thing they can do, employees quite uniquely, they can just choose not to work for you. It's a tight labor market, right? Employees increasingly look at values and what they perceive to be shared values of their company. If they don't feel that you are matching those values, it could just be harder to get good talent. And I'm not just talking about Gen Z. You know, across the board, we are seeing it's so easy to get, not easy, but easier than it has been in the past to get good jobs, particularly down here where the labor pool can be quite small that you need to really consider that. And then I just throw customers up here just as a reminder, and this can be customers as in B2C, you know, the average person on the street, but also B2B. You know, you have a, a corporate customer who may just choose not to engage with you because they do not believe that you are taking these issues seriously enough. So I've just gone through all of that. But I should also, I'd be remiss if I didn't say there are plenty of people who say that ESG isn't important and that actually it's all just a big con by a consulting industry that has risen up and is now trying to support itself. Uh, some of you may have seen, and if you haven't, I strongly urge you to Google it. The uh, then head, not now head, of sustainable investment at HSBC spoke at uh, an FT conference where he basically said that climate change was irrelevant to their investment and that it was shrill people who were just making, you know, making kind of unsubstantiated claims about the importance. His argument was that people are very innovative and we'll figure out ways. And if Miami's underwater, who cares? I'm paraphrasing, but not by much. It was, it was quite a remarkable statement. Uh, but then there are also some markets like the US where I am from, where there's been a real conflation of ESG with wokeness the kind of culture wars um, and some real backlash against ESG. So the state of Texas, I'm sure you're all shocked that it's Texas, is actually proposing not to allow financial companies to have a license to operate in Texas if they use any ESG indicators in their <laughs> investment <laughs> decisions. Welcome to Texas. Um, so the question is then, have I just wasted like 30 minutes of your life telling you about something that's not gonna matter at all in five years? I don't think so. What I do think is that the acronym ESG and this kind of cottage consulting industry, which has risen up around it, is going to shift and change. ESG is fundamentally an investor thing that now is getting broadened much more, that double materiality concept and all the rest of it. So I do think it's going to change. But the principles that underlie it, the idea about having to take in the risks that these categories of E and S and G form to your business and the impacts that you have, I think that's here to stay. And we see that through the instated intention of regulators. We see it through the intentions of investors. And we see it through the desires of community, right? Through desires of customers, the desires of our employees, which means that you do need to have a cross-functional you know, ESG risk management program in place, but again, just don't structure it against one particular ESG rating or one particular piece of regulation. Instead, you need to get a little bit more into the weeds. So what, what should you be thinking about? What, how do you need to be looking at this? 
So we've thought about, based on our experience, what we see in the market, we've mapped out what we think are the key issues that you want to be considering. So we'll start with environment with E, policy, obviously. What's the regulatory environment? Not just where we're headquartered, but the places where we operate, the places where we have exposure. How is it evolving? Also under environment, resilience. How much help are you gonna get from the government in case of an extreme event? How well prepared are you to cope with environmental disasters, be they man-made, spill, or natural? Earthquake. Also then you have to consider the climate risk in the areas where you and your supply chain and potentially your customers operate. What are the worst climate impacts for those jurisdictions? And what can you as a company do to focus on having a neutral or even potentially a positive impact on those environmental issues? That's your E, that's a lot more, but there's your basic E. Then you got your S, social. Start with labor. What are the key labor issues that you need to be across and to manage? And I know in Australia, I don't know how much this is here. In Australia, this can get really focused on like union and enterprise bargaining agreements, but you need to think much more broadly. How are we going to access labor? What are we a sector which is attractive to new labor, to emerging generations, whatever it might be? Then you have to think about community and minority issues. Which stakeholders are at risk locally and how do you engage with them? So there's you know, recent examples of this Rio Tinto and, and lack of good local engagement, but there's many others. So I work a lot with companies who are looking to grow and expand their operations. And if you're going into say Indonesia, you need to be mapping those local groups really closely because if you don't understand those dynamics, you can find yourself three years down the line, five years down the line, having totally lost your social license to operate. You also need to think about authorities under this pillar. How do you interact with global, with global with government authorities when it comes to things like security provision, data usage, and data privacy? And again, you want to be thinking about how can we have a positive or a neutral impact on this. So we're spending a lot of time right now talking with companies who are having to engage with various data regimes across Asia and figuring out how can they be compliant, but also ensure that they are aligning with the values of their company and the values of what they project to their customers. So that brings us nicely to G, to the governance. So we wanna think about obviously rule of law so do you need to compensate through your actions for any shortcomings in local rule of law? You know, we talk, you know, we can talk about regulatory gaps, but also think about things like unpredictability of regulation, court reliability, under and over representation or non-representation of groups of the population. And you want to think about corporate governance. What are the main risks relevant in the local environment for things like AML, terrorism financing, sanctions, very much so these days. And then also think about unfair business. How do you interact with the local competitive environment? Again, ideally in a way to be neutral or positive. So that could be engagement with state-owned enterprises, engagement with ruling families who may control a huge amount of an area's economic fortunes. You've got to do all of this sort of internal risk mapping and then it's also quite tricky because you have to be mapping it against the external risk environment. And this can be very overwhelming, particularly for companies with complex supply chains that span multiple jurisdictions. So I would say there, it's really about finding data sources that you trust. Um, I'm gonna put this up and I wanna really be clear, this is not a sales pitch, I'm just showing you what's out there. We have something called the ESG risk monitor, which maps exposure to specific ESG risks in a jurisdiction based on your sector. So it kind of gives you a tool where you know there's a similar methodology across country, across different countries when you're trying to do MA due diligence or portfolio benchmarking or supply chain vetting. And so I've thrown Ethiopia up here um, and you can see how the risk can change by different subsets. So if you look at environmental risk, for example, overall, the risk is medium because the country is committed to the protection of the environment. It's a signatory to all the major agreements. But the nuance is that because of funding deficits and because of 
a government focus on emergency and humanitarian issues, the environmental degradation risk actually runs to high because the commitment can't match action. So it helps to understand those sorts of nuances depending on how you would interact with the jurisdiction. Then it's also important to drill down to a country, or excuse me, a sectoral level at the country, you know, really thinking about what's material to you, because every risk does not have a similar impact on separate sectors. Again, you can't eat the whole elephant, you have to decide what you're going to focus on in each country. So if we take social risk in Ethiopia, for example, a key driver of that risk is ethnic based conflict and perceived abuse by the authorities on certain groups. And so there's a high social risk. The impact can be significant for those sectors who deal with large scale, lower skilled labor bases, those who operate extensive infrastructure with stretches across territories. And also interestingly, those who are information and tech because they can have, the government can take authoritarian approaches towards, conf, towards critics. And so you might get yourself sucked into political things. But for those sectors who are higher skilled, maybe more contained in their operations, the social risk is still high, but the impact might only be moderate. And so you can decide maybe to focus on other, on other issues. It's only a starting point, but it helps to think about where am I going to get this information and data from? So as I said towards the beginning, for companies who just want to look good to ratings agencies, I think they are really missing the point. A good ESG rating should be the byproduct of a solid ESG framework. It shouldn't be the goal of the ESG framework because the space is moving too quickly and you just can't be sure that that's going to be what matters. So I really recommend keep everything risk-based. You know, we've discussed all the different ways that you need to think about it, but also make sure that it's tied to your values as a company and the genuine actions that you are going to take that are going to produce outputs. You know, know what you're doing and why. Don't just stick a black square up on Instagram because that's what everyone else is doing. You need to understand as a company, do we believe that pursuing racial justice is a fundamental value of our company and one that we're willing to put our energy and effort behind? I can give a good example. I don't know how many of you saw, and I'm not like an Instagram person, but I would happen to be on Instagram at International Women's Day, and all these companies were putting up fantastic International Women's Day messages, and there was an NGO that was replying to each post with the wage gap for the company. <laughs> that I remember. I didn't remember who put up a pretty picture with birds for International Women's Day. And just to be clear, this isn't just activists on Instagram. The SEC is pursuing misstatements to investors about sustainability claims and public violence. They are going after greenwashing and rainbow washing, which is what people who state against the SDGs are called. So I think a critical thing to do here is to make sure you are engaging constructively with all the stakeholders. Remember all my circles, think about your stakeholders. There'll be probably be many more than what I put there and understand what they think is critical and why. And think about who within your wider organization can help with that. Get your corporate affairs function involved, get internal comms involved, HR, whatever it might be, because they're going to be a key pillar to help you understand what you need to focus on. And then you do need to be across the emerging regulatory developments, you know, get ahead of them. By the time you're pushed to make public disclosures, you want to make sure you know where your data is, what your inputs are, and how you're measuring them. And that really data is going to be one of your biggest challenges here. Once you're past that sort of initial hurdle of deciding what, what's material to us, figuring out where all that data is, who owns it, and collating it is incredibly challenging. A lot of the data you need probably already exists, but it just will live across a number of different departments who don't view it through an ESG lens. And so they're not thinking of it as ESG-specific data. So you really need to understand what you're looking for. Obviously, corporate culture is going to be critical here. Uh, many of you will have lived through the kind of years of all of us trying to convince people that anti-bribery corruption is important and tone from the top and tone from the middle will be critical here. And an education piece is going to be critical 
for your outreach efforts. This is a new area for a lot of people. We find sometimes senior leaders in particular can be a bit eh about this. The regulation helps here because they might not understand some of those other stakeholders, but they will understand regulators. And they will understand investors and they will understand being able to get insurance. So figure out which stakeholder is going to speak to those whom you need to convince. You need to think about your supply chain as well. That's probably where your biggest exposure is going to be. Particularly down here, your biggest exposure is going to live three or four layers out, but you need to be able to get all the way down, both from a reputational perspective, but increasingly from a regulatory perspective. There, and it's not simply something you can put in a contract and say you are obligated to abide by da, 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 that will not hold up. You need to be able to prove that you are really authenticating what you are doing, but also what is happening in your wider supply chain. So really try and weave these topics into everyday processes of your company and how you filter it down into your suppliers, your portfolio companies, whatever it might be. So this does require a huge amount of investment. It requires a huge amount of oversight, something none of us have extra time for. But as Pete said, I think in the when he was uh, talking about our key risk themes, we are in a period of hyper investment in ESG capacity for a number of businesses. And I do believe that the risk of not doing this, of waiting until you are absolutely obligated to by regulatory or other <laughs> stakeholders, means that you are going to be just playing a constant game of catch up. And so starting the conversations now, getting it out of some silo for a relatively junior human rights or sustainability person who sits five levels down in a risk team, getting it elevated is going to behoove you. That's the way to say that in the long run. Questions or lunch, either one. I can do questions <laughs> over lunch.